A seven-year-old bootstrap brand with 25 crore turnover. The fascinating story of Juicy Chemistry serves as an inspiration for many entrepreneurs out there. Today we have the man himself, Mr. Pratesh Asher, co-founder Juicy Chemistry, to take us through his journey. Welcome, Pratesh. Thank you, Ravi. Uh, so glad to uh, be uh, with you on the show today. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you for taking out uh, the time to join us today. So let's start off with the very basics. Uh, skincare has always been uh, something Indians are really fascinated with. It's been a part of our culture through thousands of years. Uh, how did the idea of uh, juicy chemistry come about when uh, it is already sort of a cluttered market out there? Uh, look, it's a very interesting question. Actually, we are not from the uh, background ourselves. Both Mega and I, the co-founders of Juicy Chemistry, uh, we started off uh, in 2015 with a single question that we asked ourselves uh, when a when a salesperson was trying to sell us an organic, natural, um, almost an Ayurvedic formulation. uh just out of curiosity when i turned and looked around at the labels i was able to identify a lot of petrochemicals uh now i, I was able to identify these petrochemicals because our family business was into pet manufacturing of industrial automotive uh, lubricants earlier uh and um, some of these were a part of our formulations uh in our in our previous form and i could identify uh you know sulfates i could identify some fragrances i could identify uh, you know stabilizers emulsification happening in the uh, in the product formulation uh, there were uh, other uh, chemicals that uh, were there which you know sort of started asking ourselves this question if there are ingredients which are petrochemical based in a not natural 100% ayurvedic or a pure product uh, then are we actually making the right choice as a consumer or is the consumer in fact actually understanding what they are actually putting them, putting on themselves So I think that was a question we asked ourselves uh, uh, back in 2015. If it's actually possible to make skin and personal care brand uh, formulations, which absolutely are without chemicals of any form uh, or nature in a formulation, I think that question led to the birth of Juicy Chemistry in 2015. Um, it was uh, a, an idea that we wanted to actually. Um, Dabble with. We had no idea about how formulations of skincare industry actually worked, uh, what it would take for us to actually bring about a brand. We didn't look at competition at that particular point in time. We just wanted to, you know, extinguish that curiosity that was born in our minds, uh, and that's how 2015 was the year that you know we started plunging into research, into development, reverse engineering a lot of products. uh to understand why there was a requirement for these chemicals to be a part of the formulation in the first place um that was the uh that was the basic thing that we were looking to address at that point yes when we hear the word petrochemical uh, we usually associated with the factory oil or engine oil certainly not with the skin care as such and uh, whatever we see on the shelves as uh, organic we take it as a uh, face value that it has to be natural and good for us which uh, always may not be the case so uh, when we uh, getting back to juicy chemistry and uh, the uh, organic claim it has how do we verify that is there any certification you have or uh, what is it that makes you stand out in terms of uh, the already uh, self proclaimed organic industry out there uh, look that's exactly what we were looking to address in the first place right we as a consumer uh, were so confused as to which product is actually living up to its claim uh with this incident you know it sort of led us to look at a lot of other products in the market because we wanted to understand or rather mega wanted to understand if it's possible to address her concerns that she was facing uh with her pcod issues she always dabbled with you know hormonal changes which resulted in you know acne flaring up inflammation uh, uh you know um skin being you know dull and lifeless sometimes and she she had tried a lot of products in the market but there was no efficacy in the products right and i we we uh, you know discussed amongst ourselves and and uh, looked at the opportunities of having uh, you know to switch to a more natural or an organic product because you know um, it would definitely be better in the long run is what our understanding was but none of the products in the market actually lived up to that claim in the first place 
So for, for us, it was extremely important as a consumer that the, the messaging that was coming across from the brand needed to be clear and transparent, right? And when we did not get that, it was extremely important for us to address that concern first. So we saw a huge gap in the market where what was getting um, communicated to the consumer was not the exact same product that was getting or what, as, as to what it was getting perceived is what the exact formulation was getting delivered to the customer, right? So we wanted to address that very problem of communicating, uh, you know, organic, natural, herbal, pure, etc. Uh, the product that I was getting marketed uh, was having coconut, hibiscus, and neem in the front, but it masked a lot of petrochemicals at the back. So for us, it was extremely important to address that miscommunication in the first place. And that's one of the reasons why we started looking at certification. Now, certification was not just a, a, you know, a process that we did for transparency, but we realized very quickly that transparency was just one portion of what we were looking to address. We were actually looking to address the quality of the product itself. Right? When, uh, when an organic certification was uh, getting implemented, we saw addressing uh, problems that were arising from the raw material itself. Right? There were so many conventional products that were available in the market that had absolutely no traceability to quality checks. Uh, you know, it had no clear documentation from where it came, where it was you know, produced, how it was produced, what was it getting marketed as. So there were so many gaps that were there right from the supply chain that we identified. Going organic helped us solve not just the problem of transparency, but also the quality from the soil itself, from where the product was actually getting manufactured, the raw material was getting sourced. Uh, it was important for us to know that it had the quality fit enough to be a part of the formulation in the first place, which would then eventually pass on the efficacy to the consumer on application. So that was the problem we solved when we went organic. Now, like you rightly said, there is no um, clear bifurcation or uh, you know, there is no clear marking on the, the shelves which says a product is actually organic from another, right? There are so many claims that are, that are going around in the market uh, of it being natural or organic, Ayurvedic even for that matter. How does a consumer realize or you know, understand that the product is organic? The organic certification that we have is from EcoCert France in accordance to Cosmos V3 standards, uh, which is the latest organic uh, Cosmos uh, certification that we hold from uh, France. It's a French based certification. The reason why we went to EcoCert was there was no certification that was there in India, which actually gave a framework for certifying cosmetics uh, in the first place. So after a lot of research, we saw USDA was uh, one such authority which was operating out of the US, but did not have any credentials in India for cosmetic certifications. So we looked at Europe, which was actually a little bit more stringent in terms of you know, uh, its uh, organic uh, credentials. And we said to ourselves, is it possible for us to actually go and get a certification for ourselves, not just for our uh, satisfaction of the product being organic, but can we communicate a deeper meaning to the consumer when we get a product certified. And I think we were able to address that concern when we got ourselves certified organic. So when a consumer is looking at a product, it's not important to just see the claims of organic. It's actually important to see what credentials they hold. Is there a third party agency that has you know, delivered the credential or delivered the uh, you know, audit process to the, to the concern uh, by which they are able to call themselves certified organic or then the product itself certified organic? Now, there is a difference between a product being certified organic and using few ingredients which are organic in nature and claiming to be made with certified organic ingredients. So clearly, there is, there is a lot of terminology that the consumers need to understand. And I think on our website, we do give a lot of information for the clear understanding of the word organic and what it means. Um, and uh, it's important for the consumer to go and look at that information before they make that choice. If they decided to go organic, I think they will get a wonderful amount of information uh, right from the website. You seem to be having all the certifications in place. EcoCert and USDA are not uh, easy bodies uh, to deal with given that uh, they have very strict uh, standards before they give you any kind of certificate. And uh, we also live in an era where Indians are going back to their roots and everybody wants everything that is organic, whether it is to uh, consume or apply topically. Uh, given this, uh, 
spot that you're in i would call it a sweet spot that you're in why did you choose to be a bootstrapped brand and uh, you could have easily raised investments from outside but why did you put your own money into it uh, look when we started off uh, we started off you know very very small uh, or we we started off with about 5000 rupees in our pocket and a makeshift kitchen just to understand if the concept of going completely free of you know preservatives sulfates parabens uh, basically anything that was not required to be there in the formulation in the first place or is it actually possible to make skin and personal care uh, products without use of any externally manufactured lab ingredients uh, and is it possible for us to you know address skin or hair care problems directly from what nature had to offer in its raw form possible i think that's the question we asked ourselves back in 2015 but at that time we were not actually convinced ourselves uh, uh, is it possible to make a formulation is the formulation going to be stable is there a market is there somebody going to be you know interested in in such products so there were a lot of unanswered questions in our minds first and i think it was important for us as founders to you know get convinced about what we were doing before we went around convincing our our customers uh, about the efficacy of our products so i think it was important for us to you know do that research to understand formulations to understand the stability to understand the gap in the market and we started off very small uh, we used to do uh, local trade shows uh, in 500 rupee trade shows that used to come in the city we used to stand behind the stall make the consumers understand about our product proposition find that uh, you know concern and try to address that concern with what was available naturally in the environment that we were living around right so it was important for us to you know use local ingredients to understand if we can uh, address those concerns with those local ingredients that were available because obviously money was a little difficult to come by in terms of resource so we couldn't invest too much uh, and experiment too much as well but when we started off we realized that the consumers were actually happy with the product and they always came back for more because they actually started seeing results with simple formulations which were not complicated uh, raw but clean ingredients uh, when they started using uh, it in their skin and personal care regime they saw wonderful benefits out of it and that gave us the confidence to actually go and invest large in larger shows to understand uh, you know if there is a market in the in the bigger cities i mean um, uh, that was important to address first and i think up till about 2016 we did that and then we started getting confidence in in our in ourselves and we we uh, we backed our uh formulations with research backed articles we started doing efficacy studies we started doing a lot of um you know back end work to understand if you know this is able to you know scale in terms of business and i think in 2017 we started thinking like an organization right? we started actually believing that yes this is this could be an organization that we can we can make big um we started uh, looking at you know outside investment in terms of family and friends around etc and also in terms of angel investment but i think uh, we were much smaller that time uh, and i think we needed to prove ourselves a little bit more and in fact in 2019 when the tailwinds were very strong for us um, in terms of interest uh, for investment in juice chemistry i think we took that plunge in 2019 and we actually raised a, a 6.5 a 650000 uh, dollar round uh, which was a seed round uh and we quickly scaled after that round in 2020 and by the end of 2020 we were primed for a series a round and i think uh, you know that was the time when we had to you know start thinking about scaling operations uh, as a brand because we were getting a lot of recognition people had started using the products and they had they had seen wonderful results with it uh, we had already served uh, you know international markets in about 20 countries our own indian market was phenomenal um with you know e-commerce taking off extremely well uh behind uh, the the pandemic of course accelerated it uh in um, 2021 it was about 3 months back uh, in march uh, we were able to close our 6.3 million dollar round which was a series a round post which we also did a strategic tie up with spring marketing capital which was another 650000 dollars so in total we raised about 7.2 uh, million dollars that seems to be a uh... a very long uh, and at the same time a very exciting and fulfilling journey from uh, what i can sense uh, the passion towards your product is uh, of course clearly visible uh, given the gusto with which you describe uh, your journey here 
but uh, when we talk about uh, any startup journey it's of course not uh, deprived of any challenges and it is not uh, as smooth as it seems to be i'm sure that must have been in your case as well so uh, given that you source your uh, products from uh, different parts of india and uh, logistics sector here is still fairly unorganized what were the challenges you faced uh, in that particular domain yeah absolutely uh, uh, obey in fact uh, juicy chemistry as a brand doesn't just source ingredients from india we source ingredients from almost 25 different countries uh, because we don't use uh, you know lab grown ingredients or chemically processed agro ingredients if i have to put it correctly uh, and only use physically processed agro ingredients we need to get to the source of where those ingredients grow best in its habitat uh, for example we go to spain and greece to get our olive we go to australia to get our tree tree oil uh, and sandalwood oil uh bulgaria for our roses and lavender essential oils and hydrosols uh and so on and so forth so for us it's extremely important as a brand um uh, to source high quality organic important ingredients which we can use in our formulations and manufacture fresh for our for our customers and sort of deliver directly from our manufacturing unit into their hands uh and freshness thereby becomes a factor for efficacy as well as far as juicy chemistry is formulation by concern so when you're right when you say when in when we are sourcing so many things across uh, not just india but around the world as well logistics and um uh, you know uh, organization of the supply chain becomes a little bit uh, challenging i think in india like you rightly mentioned uh, you know it's still a very unorganized sector in fact it takes sometimes a little longer for us to source ingredients within india than it takes for us to you know sort of get ingredients from africa or bulgaria even uh, and organic as a as a you know as a business or as a market in india is still very very young i think it's in very nascent stages of operation but i think we'll see a lot more of the farmers you know add um to the organic uh, farming output in india uh, eventually in the next 5 uh, to 10 years down the line but sourcing of these ingredients first is 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 a very big challenge because people are yet to you know adapt organic as a as a large scale farming method uh, that's one secondly once you sort you know, identify organic ingredients to source it back to your manufacturing unit is also a little time consuming because um obviously the infrastructure is still developing but i think we've come a long way from where we were almost 5 years back now with the e-commerce boom coming in i think you see a lot more connectivity a lot of smaller hubs uh, uh you know cities or two tier cities having a lot of connectivity now that uh, you know there is a market to be serviced uh, things are much better today than they were about 5 years when we started it used to take us somewhere around 45 to 60 days to source organic and this has strategically come down uh to about 20 to 25 days but i still think that you know there is a huge scope for improvement as far as uh, logistics in india is concerned but i think you know we are um uh, on top of this game because you know for us uh, you know working with the farmers is is one of the uh, the major uh, uh you know supply chain problems that we have to live with because we have to rely on you know um uh, the output that comes from the organic farm um you know water of course rain uh, weather conditions the crop itself uh, and and sometimes the failure of the crop all actually have a impact on our on our business so i think we 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 you know try to understand that pattern uh, as far as uh, you know the growth cycle of these crops are concerned and we work very closely with our farmers to understand you know the output the requirement for the uh, forward booking and you know supporting those farmers um as well over a period of time uh, and you know we formed that that wonderful connect in terms of you know the supply chain for us to you know keep our business scaling as and when we scale our business also our requirement goes up in terms of raw materials and i think we are able to address that by supporting those farmers and i think today they have a lot more um, you know resources available even in terms of you know transportation and logistics for us to get those ingredients fresh uh, in our manufacturing unit our manufacturing unit is also actually certified organic by ecocert therefore you know we don't do any conventional products in our business that for making it india's largest organic manufacturing facility um, and i think for us um, uh, it, it's a it's a wonderful uh, satisfying 
journey as well to work along with the farmer and see them prosper uh, as as we are growing in this journey as well. So uh, I think in, in time you will see that you know the logistic problem that we are facing in India will start to you know ease out a little bit. Uh, but at this point we are uh, having to maneuver uh, through uncertainties and COVID is not helping obviously. Uh, but I think we'll get there. Right, since we are uh, on the topic of farmers and uh, logistics and uh, COVID is the last thing that we discussed, uh, a thought comes to my mind that logistics was at least initially negatively impacted by uh, the pandemic-induced yes. lockdown. How were you able to sustain uh, juicy chemistry during those difficult times given that you sourced from very specific locations? How was the delivery carried out? Well, I think last year when... when you know, when the pandemic was was fresh uh, in its, uh, you know, way, if I may put it that way, when, when it hit, it's needless to say that I think none of the organizations were actually prepared for it, right? It hit, when it hit, it hit very quickly. There was hardly any time for any institutions to, you know, adapt or, you know, be prepared for of this large scale transition that we were actually looking at. And I think it's safe to say that uh, you know, because we were not prepared, there was, the, the demand was not very hardly hit at that particular point in time, but the supply chain was hit very badly, right? So we were, we were uh, still gasping for, uh, you know, supplies. We, there was a demand that was there in the market that needed to be fulfilled because there was no offline. The burden for fulfillment of the demand lied on the online channels. But the problem that we were facing was supply chain. Uh, we were not able to get the raw materials in house for us to, you know, fulfill that demand. And I think this time around, uh, during the second wave, I think the companies actually were more prepared in terms of supply chain. I think there was a lot of, uh, you know, preparedness. Uh, I, I think that was phenomenal transition. I think it's great how um, entrepreneurs uh, in India, both old school and the new generation entrepreneurs, adapted so extensively well. Uh, in this in this period, right? So we were prepared for the uh, for the second and, the, and hopefully not the third wave, but you know we were prepared during the second wave, uh, where you know the supply chain was not a problem anymore. We were we were well stocked. We anticipated some things uh, earlier on, and we we ensured that you know we were really prepared to um, to to fulfill the demand that that was going to get generated. And obviously, the demand has gone up as well, like you rightly said about specific industry products like you know health and personal care as well as has uh, has been benefited during this covid times and i think the demand is there for the taking uh, we were more prepared around this time so although there were disruptions on the ground uh, and clear disruptions on the ground i think we maneuvered extensively well but yes last mile supply chain was again an issue which uh, our customers also understood because uh, there was something that you know the companies just couldn't uh, help uh, it was out of our hands as well but i think uh, in in the future um, there will be consolidation in, in the sense that you know com companies will definitely be prepared uh, uh, for this kind of a situation in the in the future as well nobody was prepared for the covid lockdown i think we had a buffer of about uh, 3 hours between when the lockdown was announced and when it was to be implemented so yes it has uh, we have all been forced to step up our digital game so to say uh, that has been true to the logistics uh, industry as well. However, uh, one question that comes to my mind is, uh, how was Juicy Chemistry able to support the farmers during these difficult times? Because a lot of them are uh, in rural areas. They might not even be as aware about uh, COVID or the lockdown as we have been. Uh, how are you helping uh, these people during the lockdown and otherwise in general? Uh See, for us, um, you know, it's a, it's a long-term association uh, with the farmers because, you know, organic as a, like I said, organic as a, as a market is extremely niche in India. Uh, although there is, a, there is a huge adaptation for food uh, in organic, you will see a lot of organic USDA certified uh, food ingredients like rice, wheat, oats, um, you know, uh, dal. Uh, th that's that's a trend that has you know hit uh, India about a decade ago and, and about three or four decades ago back in in the US and in the Western countries. I think India has adapted to organic just in the last decade and it's more so in the last five years. Um, I think with the for, for us, you know, it's important that we keep continuing to support the farmer because 
uh, at, at this point, they are the most vulnerable, right? Because they don't have offtake. Uh, and the promised offtake was uh, uh, when it's not taken. I think they, they also struggle with, uh, you know, paying uh, the laborers, uh, you know, then, then the harvesting gets, uh, uh, you know, take, takes a back seat. Uh, they are not able to provide uh, them transportation for them to, you know, come uh, reap the, the crops, make sure the processing happens correctly. The, anyways, the skilled, uh, the organic skilled farmer uh, needs to be, you know, present on the ground uh, to ensure that the quality does not get affected. There are so many variants that, that you know, the, uh, the farmers need to look into. What we did uh, during this time was, you know, just give the assurance to the, to the farmers. And we always, uh, you know, try to fulfill our commitments to the farmers. Although we couldn't take deliveries uh, during that month and a half, we continued to support them uh, with the financial help that they required to keep the farmers, to keep their families up and running in all sense of it, um, uh, uh, economic uh, as well as well as support, moral support in any way possible, and also helping them with forward bookings for the next year as well. So in some of the cases where, you know, there was extreme, uh, you know, dire situation where the, the crop had to be reaped and there, there were some forward bookings that had to happen, we actually supported them for the next year as well. So they could keep their farmers and keep their, uh, you know, local talent that they, they hire, uh, all of them supported uh, and, and, you know, for them to not, look at you know other alternatives uh, in terms of you know earning their bread i think we did a lot of work uh, with our farmers not just in india but internationally as well where uh, you know there were some seasons uh, that uh, the crop was ready for harvest uh, we were not able to uh, you know procure those ingredients but we made sure that we made our commitments we made those payments for uh, for those uh, ingredients that we were going to be consuming throughout the year i think now the farmers are also supporting us back by you know holding that stock for us ensuring that you know we get it during our requirement and support us through the rest of the year as well so i think it's a give and take situation always um, and that uh, and like any supply chain we are also uh, making sure our commitments are met and the farmers are not affected by any negative uh, situations that are not in ours and their control okay so uh, you seem to be taking uh, everybody along in inclusivity uh, which is one of the buzzwords uh, these days seems to be the motto of uh, juicy chemistry so um, kudos to you for that. And before we let you go for the day, I wanted to ask you another thing. Uh, when we talk about farmers and crops, another thing that comes to mind is groundwater usage. And uh, company these days are uh, betting heavily on uh, ESG compliance and ESG compliance scores are coming up. How does Juicy Chemistry uh, plan to maintain that uh, image or should I say a true image of a Juicy Chemistry organic brand? that is sustainable in the long run when groundwater or any of these natural resources are uh, heavily in demand when we talk about these brands? Look, uh, that's a great question, uh, Ruby. Actually, when you look at organic as a concept, it's actually a very inclusive con concept. Right? It's not just about quality. It's not about um, the ingredients. It's not just about you know sustainability. It's, it's actually transparency and traceability as well, of course, if I may add those two very important factors of organic uh, certification. I think it's it's a culmination of everything put together, right? Uh, organic farms actually use much less in terms of water and, uh, you know, uh, fossil fuels that in that sense, because they use organic manure. Uh, they don't need to rely on, uh, you know, heavily, uh, Chemically, uh, I, I would say they don't need to rely too much on chemicals in terms of you know getting nutrition back into the soil, which uses a lot of fossil fuels for the manufacturing of those chemicals in the first place. Actually, organic soil holds 40% more water naturally than a commercial soil. It's binding better. Uh, it has less erosion. It, it is actually... In, in, a, in, in a situation of drought, it's uh, documented that it has 45% better output than a commercial uh, uh, crop. So when you look at an organic farm from an overall perspective, it's more sustainable because it uses less fossil fuels. It's great because it don't, doesn't use any sort of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, insecticides, GMO-based crops. And therefore the groundwater is also under the organic soil is much more cleaner and uh, great for uh, you know, the soil water, soil bed condition as well. 
And at the same time, the nutrient profile that comes out of an organic farm is almost 60% better than a the crop that comes out from a conventional farm. So the only problem that the farmers face is you know, getting the right price for that produce that they are making. And I think where they stand to, uh, you know, um, gain from doing a certified organic um, farming is that you know there is a lot of interest from international markets as well, today, like coconut, uh, cocoa production, uh, you know, turmeric, rice, and you will see that rice uh, has been exported in a record number, and, and the organic output has been phenomenal, and the number of export, the, the quantum of exports that has happened for organic rice is also extremely high in this year. So there is a huge amount of interest that is coming from international markets, which have already developed organic certifications. I think that's where the farmer is able to get almost three to four times uh, in terms of you know, benefits for the crop that they are manufacturing on that same soil as opposed to a conventional product. So I think overall, the initial period of around three years is going to be a little difficult for the farmer where they have to make sure that you know the soil is clean they don't use fertilizers maybe the output drops uh, in the first three years but then post which once they have committed to an organic certification it's not just the soil the environment the sustainability as a as a farmland as a as a as a farmer they stand to actually gain from organic farming by realizing more value for the crop they are producing not just in india but also in the international market our farmers have started, uh, you know, exporting to countries like Germany, US, Australia, um, and uh, you know, are also manufacturing, uh, you know, value-added goods, uh, which are, you know, uh, exported in 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 frozen, um, uh, in frozen uh, forms as well, and they are able to, you know, value add to those products that they're manufacturing and stand to gain about eight to ten times of what they would gain if they had sold the produce in its original form in the local market. So I think overall, uh, the farmers are getting the long-term benefit uh, and advantages are actually visible now to the farmers. And I think more and more people are converting uh, or at least trying to uh, take positive efforts towards converting some portion of their land to organic farm. Okay, so that's quite... Uh... Heartening to see that uh, Indian brands are uh, expanding uh, internationally and taking uh, a part of the Indian culture to the world market while benefiting uh, the local farmers. So that's uh, really good to hear. And uh, I would like to thank you so much, Pratesh, for joining us and uh, an insightful uh, discussion regarding UC chemistry and uh, organic brands in general. Thank you for joining us.